Well, the talk today is on you get what you measure. Now, you're likely to think that means if you measure accurately, you'll have accurate answer. If you don't, you don't. But it means something quite different. It means that the kind of measurements you make will affect the organization. Now, the reason for talking to you on this is because many of you will find yourself either installing or okaying the installation of some further measuring system. And you should start thinking further than the average person does what happens when you put in a measuring system. So the whole talk is really about that. Or if you want, how do you manage? Because you're going to have to find out a great deal of information that is not now generally collected. Because times are changing. Well, I will go back to the story I've told you twice before, I think. Editing the story about the people who went fishing with a net. They examined the fish they caught, and they decided there was a minimum size fish in the sea. You see, the instrument they used affected what they got. It affected the conclusions they drew. Had they used a different size net, they would have come down to a different minimum size, but they still would have come down to minimum size. If they used a hook and sinker, it might have been somewhat different. The way you'll go about making a measurement will affect what you see and what conclusions you draw. That's the simplest example I can give you of the phenomenon. Now, another example well known is the business of recent years of measuring a profit by the bottom line every quarter. If I'm going to look at the profit every quarter and want to maximize it, it's not going to have any long range planning and it's not going to do well in the long run. Optimization in the small, quarter by quarter by quarter, does not produce optimization in the large. You must do long-term planning as well as short-term planning. And these two often conflict, and you have to think about how you're going to measure progress in your organization. Is it by short-term goals or long-term goals? Now, if everyone starts out in a rating system where everybody is 95% efficient, then there are a lot of things you can do to ruin your rating, but not much that you can do to improve it. Therefore, your strategy in that situation is to be quiet and don't rock the boat. The result is that some years later, as you start looking around for who you can make head, you have a large number of people, most of whom are conservatives and have not rocked the boat at all. They play things conservatively. Your method of promotion along the way has affected what you can get when you want to make a final choice. It may well be you want a risk taker. Your organization may be going down the pipe slowly and headed for ruin, and you'd rather have a risk taker who either ruins it rapidly or saves the organization. Well, if you've promoted for conservatism, you won't have that choice. There isn't one out there to choose from. On the other hand, you can do the opposite. You can give everybody a 20% rating. Then almost everybody will have to set out and try and show they got something to improve their rating. And you will have a large number of risk takers. At the top end, when you want the company to run smoothly, all you've got a bunch of guys who will take risks. And that's not good either. You have to think about how the system which you use for selection and promotion affects the whole organization. Your rating system affects what can happen. Now, of the things you choose to measure, some are easy to measure and some are hard. For example, it's easy to measure your height and your weight. It's hard to measure your morale. It's hard to measure your intelligence. Well, there's a confusion between what is reliably measured and what is relevant. To give a simple illustration, suppose we decide promotion was going to be based upon height. It would be a highly reliable, consistent method of promotion. There's no quarrel, you'll always get the right guy because you measure accurately. But height apparently has very little to do with ability to manage at the top. Therefore, an accurate measure may be totally irrelevant, but because it's accurate, it's used. A difficult measurement like morale 
may not be used because it's hard to measure, but it may be the thing you want. And that's a very, very difficult thing. There's a constant tendency to go for something you can measure easily rather than go for something which is relevant. Furthermore, they want a reproducible measure, but uh, that may not be what you truly want. Now, let me give you an example of how things work. I'll take the topic of IQs, which is a generally interesting topic. Let's consider how it was done. Binet made up a bunch of questions, asked quite a few people the questions, looked at the grades, and decided that some of the questions were relevant and correlated with other ones, and some were not. So he threw out the ones that did not correlate. He finally came down to a large number of questions which produced consistency. Then he measured. And now we'll take the score. We run across it. Now I'm going to take the cumulative amount. How many people got at least this score? How many got this score? I'll divide by the total number each time. So I will get a curve. That's one. It will always be rising since I'm calculating the cumulative number. Now I want to calibrate the exam. Well, here is the place where 50% of people are above and 50% are below. If I drop down to uh, 34 units down and 34 above, I'm within one sigma, 68% two sigma, and so on. Now, what do I do? When you get a score, I go up here, across there, and I give you the IQ. Now you discover, of course, what I've done. IQs are normally distributed. I made it that way. I made it that way by my calibration. So when you are told that the IQs are normally distributed, you have two questions. Did the guy measure the intelligence? Now what they wanted to do was get a measure which was such that for age, uh, for the score divided by the age, it would remain fairly constant for about the first 20 years. So the IQ of a child of 6 and the IQ of a child of 12 would be the same. You divide by 12 and by 6. They had a number of other things they wanted to accomplish. They wanted IQ to be independent of a lot of things. Whether they got it or not, or whether they should have tried that, is another question. But we are now stuck with IQ, designed to have a normal distribution. If you think intelligence is not normally distributed, all right, you're entitled to your belief. If you think the IQ tests don't measure intelligence, you're entitled to your belief. They haven't got proof that it does. The assertion and the use doesn't mean a thing. And the consistency with which a person has the same IQ is not a proof that you're measuring what you wanted to measure. Now this is characteristic of a great many things we do in our society. We have methods of measurement which get the kind of result we want. Take for example when I used to teach calculus classes. Suppose on the final exam I could ask every question exactly equally difficult. The distribution of grades, zero, would tend to be like this. Either you knew what it was or you didn't, because they were all about the same hard. You either got them all or you didn't get them all. On the other hand, if I ask a fair number of easy questions, particularly at the beginning to get the students settled down, and I ask a couple of very difficult ones, I would expect to get a distribution like this. They all got some. Some got more, and a few got the very best. Very few got all of them, high score. Well, it's evident that if I know the class, I can get any distribution I want. I have to know the class reasonably well. Now, what normally happens, at least to me, is when it comes down to a final, while I have some pretty good ideas, I am really worried about the people who are going to flunk or not. Those are the ones I'm worried about. So I ask an exam so I get a very sharp cut there. And I'm not too worried. Furthermore, 
The evidence, if contested, can be shown to other people and they'll say, yeah, he deserved a flunk or she deserved a flunk. So on giving a final exam, I have several goals, one of which is to make sure I've identified the flunks. I'd like to identify the best grades, but I also have to investigate and have real good evidence that the flunks are flunks because it's a serious matter to flunk a student. Now another thing which you should think about is the dynamic range. Suppose I ask you to score something 1 to 9 with 5 being the average. Often happens. Rate this. I score 1 to 9 with 5 being the average. Or 0 to 10. You've had them. Well, most people will pick 4s and 6s. They like that, they didn't like that. Suppose I have the same likes and dislikes you do, but instead of doing four and six, I use nines and ones and twos. So if you like a person and you score six, and I dislike them, equally amount as you like them, and I score a two, the effect is that mine will dominate the rating of the person. I use the dynamic range as a whole, you cluster down here. Very common tendency is to cluster down here and not use the dynamic range. As a result, considering how most things are measured later on, you have very little effect against the other person who has got a stronger use of the total dynamic range. In fact, you remember from information theory that if I've got a scoring system and I'm trying to communicate information, the maximum entropy occurs when all the symbols are used equally. If I regard grading as communication to other people how well these students are doing, I should have all the grades straight across the line pretty uniform. Well, we don't do this because flunking is very serious and some other ones. Instead of that, particularly in graduate school and universities, we give A's and B's only and don't give lower grades. As a result, we do a very poor job of communicating much information. We should do the other. Now, there's another method which is used in U.S. Naval Academy, among other places, and that is you are rated in a class of seven, you're five out of seven, or you're 17 out of 25. This is a method of avoiding grade inflation, and it's a way that the total dynamic range is used. The fault is mainly the following, and it's not too bad a fault. There may be a chance that, that five very capable people are in the same class, and one of them has to be the dummy, the bottom of five. So being lowest of five doesn't mean you're dumb, but uh, it may. It has that weakness. On the other hand, it probably is much better than our present methods. Because in rating people, is a surprising thing. It applies in many, many areas. You can rate people better or worse without assigning a score. And let me tell you about the experience of Bell Laboratories. Bell Labs had, at those days, two times when they measured people. One was for promote, what were rating, and the other was for salary. These were done completely separately. Now, I was often involved in the rating because, among other things, a group rating themselves always rate themselves high. And the company has to get some comparison between how good is Joe over in, say, metallurgy with Mary, who's over in computing. How can I compare these two people? Because every group always thinks their people are the best. And since I had wide range of experience meeting people, working with them, and the computers covered a whole range, I had frequently been invited to these rating ones and asked to attend. So I saw how it worked. I want to digress slightly now and say something and get back to that. You tend not to like to rate people. As a child, even as a young PhD instructor, I didn't like to rate people. I remember the Bible. He who is out sin cast the first stone, or judge not lest ye be judged, and so on. I didn't like it. But I came to realize it must be done. Everybody cannot be the head of the organization. We don't have organization with everybody at the same level very often. Even in entertainment, a bunch of skits of an evening, 
Someone has to be first and someone has to be last. Among lecturers giving a series of lectures at a meeting, some speaker is first and some speaker is last. And it makes a difference. Therefore, since you're going to have to rate, you might as well study. And I began studying the rating when I was involved in these rating ones. And the best one I know of is a guy named Hank McDonald and me. Now, in my opinion, Hank was a genius, and I think that Hank thought I was pretty good, too. But we didn't agree. Hank was a builder of things. He could put together central offices and all kinds of things. He built with his hands. I was a theoretician. I thought. I went at it differently. He and I go to lunch in a restaurant, and it wouldn't be 10 minutes before we were yelling at each other, because we didn't agree on anything. Well, we both turned up at rating. So long as you asked us, was Joe better than Pete, Hank and I would agree. The moment you said why, Hank and I were Joe's throats, because we didn't agree on why. So this rating business, you want to be careful. The subjective judgments may be very good, but the verbal ones may be highly in disagreement. And my belief is that the fact that Hank and I rated Joe above Pete meant that Joe was probably better than Pete. But when you ask why, oh, you got an argument between Hank and Hamming over what was going on, because we had different standards. But you see, looking at the person as a whole, we saw the same capable person. So when I say you make these rating judgments, it's very true. And a friend of mine who used to be involved with skiing said they would watch people coming down the slope and rate the skiers, not numerical value, just rate them in order. And again, he said, huh, as long as we didn't say why, skater, skier A was better than B, there was no trouble. It's when we got down to saying why, there was trouble. So in making rating systems, one thing to do is just ask them to rate one above the other and don't ask for the reasons. You'll be somewhat better off. When you get down to the reasons, you're now putting intuitive judgments into words and you're getting in trouble. My experience watching for a long while, I came to believe that the relative judgment is a very good one for people who are reasonably mature in a business and study it. It's one of the best methods. Now, there's another thing you want to watch. The people you initially attract are the people you later have. You attract people by the appearance your field has to others. Thus, you know mathematics has a reputation among students. But let's take the psychologists. As I look at students in psychology, they look to me like they were more mixed up than the average undergraduate. Furthermore, the professors were. And what the psychology department did was not to unmix the kids, but mix them up further. So the psychology graduates were really mixed up people. They attracted that kind of people. Every field attracts. Now let's take mathematics and uh, computer science both. In mathematics through calculus, and certainly the beginning of computer science, the essence of the beginning is the ability to cope with a sea of detail. You've got to do all kinds of long differentiations without mistakes in algebra and so on. Or you've got to write a program with no bits wrong, every instruction right. It's a sea of detail. This is what they see when they come into the field. And those who are great, I will call minutia people, people who pay attention to the minutia, they are attracted. But at the top, there's a bigger picture. And so you have quite a few people in computer science who come out, but they're still minutial people. They never get the bigger picture. Same way in mathematics. There's a great many mathematicians who are technicians and really never learn mathematics. We attracted one class of people, and we're stuck with them afterwards. The kind of people you attract originally will be the people who are leaders in the next generation. They have to come from the people you're now hiring. There is no alternate. So it's a problem. At Bell Labs, I, wa I became, in a sense, part of public relations. I may have told you this. At Bell Labs let me travel wherever I wanted to, practically when I wanted to, and the universities knew that they'd get a lecture from Hamming with only paying local costs. I would, Bell Labs would pay the transportation. They would take care of me on the ground, pay the hotel bill, and feed me and such other things, and get me back on the airplane if necessary. 
Although, if I had to rent a car, Bell Labs paid that. Well, I went a lot of places. I saw a lot of things. My role was the following. I went out and gave an enthusiastic lecture. I didn't say Bell Labs was great. I just said the kind of things we did and made it sound exciting. Three months later, when the recruiters came around, they didn't have as so much trouble persuading people to work for Bell Labs. In short, I knew that I was a carrot being dangled in front of the students, saying, this is what does happen at Bell Labs. People do do exciting things. And I did. But of course, most of them weren't going to have exciting lives like I did. You must pay attention to whom you attract at the beginning or at the back end. You'll be stuck with those people you attracted and hired. There's nobody else available to you. Once in a while, you can go outside the organization to hire, but generally it's not too good a thing because it ruins internal morale. If it's widely known the company or the organization goes outside to get the top, people aren't going to want to hang around who are able. They're going to go someplace else where they can succeed rather than somebody out, outside running it. So it's a very great problem who you first attract. And it's not what actually is true, it's what the perceived feature of your field. The perception of mathematics is it's very hard and it's full of detail. Well, I don't think so. I think mathematics is comparatively easy, all things considered, and it's not detail. It's the organization of whole ideas. It's the organization of bigger bodies of knowledge. I told you in systems engineering, it seemed to me the mathematician played the role of the systems engineer, the person who kept the whole together as a whole. He played the bigger role, the dominant role, in a sense. Not the managerial role, but the conscience of big organizations. Mathematicians, some of them, have that ability to see the whole as a whole. That's very valuable. But that's one of those things. Now, personnel employment, if you send them out to hire people for research, you get yourself in trouble. What you want in research is people with original ideas. But a person who has original ideas in one place is likely to have other original ideas in other places, such as how to dress or whether to comb their hair or such things. Thus, personnel doesn't like the looks of some of the best researchers, and they would never hire them. Bell Labs was forced to do what I told you. I went out and preliminary recruited, and the recruiters who went out were not personnel people. They were members, senior members of the research department who went out and recruited and could recognize somebody with originality in physics was also original in his personal behavior patterns sometimes. Huh. If you're going to get well-behaved people, you aren't going to get great researchers. Uh, eccentricity correlates with other features. You can't have outstanding ability in one area and not likely have outstanding abilities in other directions and outstanding beliefs of other things. So uh, Bell Labs simply gave up personnel department. And when the people came in that were hired by research, personnel department shuttered. And generally, there wasn't much they could do, but at least one man that a lot of us wanted to hire, I didn't, but a lot of us did, uh, they got him off on medical grounds. He weighed something like 400 pounds. And they thought uh, on physical grounds they didn't want to get that heavy a person in and then be medically responsible to a great extent. So he was turned down by personnel because he was just too, too big. I had other reasons for not wanting him, but most of my friends wanted him. Now there's another feature that's very vicious about an organization. I told you I was on the board of directors. The board of directors has great power over who is going to be promoted at last stages and also who's going to be on the board next time. In short, they self-select. Now how do they select? Generally, they will select people like themselves with whom they'll be comfortable or as I told you about my boss, Boda, who behaves the way they behave where they succeeded. Rather than hiring the people who are going to be good for the future, they hire people like they were when they were succeeding. So there tends to be a great homogeneity at the top level. They hire people with whom they'll be comfortable. The result is you do have an organization spirit. It's a uniform one. It's not someone this way, someone this way, and some other one, but it's all pretty much the same. 
but it's also not likely to be highly innovative. It's true widely. If you do the other one, the higher troublemakers at the top, you have a lot of trouble coming to decisions. So there's a problem about this. Now, when I was in college, it was a rule pretty strongly understood that math departments do not hire their own graduates. That this inbreeding is too bad. As I look now around what little I see, apparently that's no longer being observed. Many university hires its own graduates. Now this extreme centralization of one type or another has caused trouble in universities, and several times I know of, the top management, being the president and a couple of deans, have stepped in at economics departments and said, you're loaded with one school of economics, we must have breath, we are doing the hiring until we get a balanced department. It's happened in law. It's happened in several departments, psychology too, where top management has stepped in a university and forced the hiring of the department to be broad rather than highly concentrated. Well, but if the top is concentrated, there's nobody above to do that. And it's a problem. So when you are promoting people, think about the question, am I promoting somebody who I'm just going to be comfortable with? Or am I producing too damn much homogeneity in the organization? What am I doing when I promote? How much am I shaping the company for better or worse? How much goes on? What rating system, what evaluation system shall we use? Those which make us comfortable? Well, yes, you don't want chaos at the top. You don't want a board of directors who are squabbling all the time. You want a compatible one, but you want some independence of opinion. Thus, most boards of corporations have insiders and outsiders. The ratio changes enormously from company to company. When I was with, I think there were about three outsiders and about five insiders, something like that. Maybe four and five, something like that order. There were a fair number of outsiders. That means outside views are brought in and we temper them. But most of all, what we did was simple. By our presence, they had to stop and think, how will it look to outsiders when we do this? How will that look like, that promotion look like to independent board members who are not involved in the company from moment to moment? The mere presence of the outsiders forced the insiders to be much more conscious of how their behavior looked. And that is a good thing. So in many places you have this. Now you have this in the government periodically by panels. Outside panels are brought in. I've served on innumerable government panels one time or other to make a survey every other year of such and such a department or something like that. Well, what happens to a great extent is this. If the recommendations of the panel are what the organizers and the guys who are running it want to do, they cite them. If they don't, they ignore them. And I met a brilliant one in the patent. We made a recommendation, but I being a bit of a bastard that I am, I asked, let's look at some of the previous recommendations back for the last 10 or 15 years. Every one of them had the same recommendation we were making. Our major recommendation was exactly the same for the last five panels, but they had never acted on it. That's what often happens when you try to get outsiders to break up the inbreeding that occurs because you tend to promote people like yourself or the people who you are comfortable with. It's a problem, and the outside people are the rule. And you want to get some strong outsiders to serve and I'm afraid you have to pay them moderately well. Although, in my case, uh, I would have done it practically for nothing. Because I had once said to myself, uh, sometime earlier before I accepted the appointment, oh, I'll tell you the whole story. I was asked uh, by the president to serve as a board of directors. I didn't want to, what the hell? I got my own business to do, I'm a scientist. So I went to the legal department and got a decision. You can't do it. Well. Some time passed, I realized my interests were getting narrower and narrower and narrower, and some extrapolations suggested that when I finally retired, I'd be interested in absolutely nothing. That I'd better do something about broadening my interests. Yep, Hammond, you've got to accept new opportunities that are different. Well, 
The president calls me up again and says, we're now on New York Stock Exchange listed. How about being on the board of directors now? I just said to myself, I got to accept new opportunities. I said to myself, okay. I went down to the legal department, got a decision that I could. And so I was on the board of directors. I got it for a new experience. And I think that most outsiders do this for that reason, although I'm not sure. Serving on the panels in Washington, it's no great trouble. You hop the early morning shuttle flight out of Newark and got down there in time for the meeting, and you hop the shuttle when you came home, whenever it was over with. You learn a lot on the outside role. And I'm commending you again. You want to study, when you get these chances, how do these things work? How does promotion actually work? How does information really go about? And what should you be doing? There are plenty of opportunities to serve outside. For example, school boards and so on. Every once in a while, they need some outsiders on the school board. That's an opportunity to look at the question of how to manage things successfully, how to prevent inbreeding too much, but how at the same time to keep a coherent, coherent team working together instead of fighting. It's a very interesting problem. Now, let me tell you another story. <clears throat> there was a method, there is a method, Bode's phase gain integral. If you give me the gain, frequency versus gain, there is a way of calculating the minimum amount of phase shift you must have of various frequencies if you've got that gain curve. Let's go to the Bose phase gain integral. Well, they had in the early days, let's get the black one, they had done it by hand. What they had done is fitted this curve by a straight line there, a straight line there, a straight line there, a straight line there, a straight line there. And then looking up in Thomas's tables, they could get numbers out and everything would be fine for voice channels. Well, they hit the problem of a television channel. Enormous bandwidth. The curvers have it looking like that. Just incredible detail. They know perfectly well the arbitrary drawing of lines on that Two guys doing it get different answers. Furthermore, while they could do it for a voice channel, for a television channel, they couldn't. So I got involved in it. And uh, I produced, finally, a machine solution. I was talking to one time to the guys on the receiving end, and one of the shooter guys said to me, <clears throat> it's not that your answers are necessarily better than we could do by hand. He said, but they're consistent. Before, when it was done by hand, we could get no further insight because there was this big random choice of how the individual might have chosen to draw those lines. Now, since you're doing it systematically, we can have a chance of getting down further beneath the surface and understanding more subtle effects. And you can see why it's true. You can see why human judgments, because they're variable, may not be desirable in some respects. On the other hand, I'm now going to argue that, by and large, I have more faith in human judgments than I have in measuring instruments to a great extent. A uh, human animal is a complex thing. He's more complicated than a vector. He's probably more complicated even in tensors and matrices. Yet, for promotion, they must be ordered in line to who is the best candidate. Or who are the three best candidates if you're getting promotion to professorship or something? Or who are the ten best if you're going to some other, some other level? The whole complicated human being plus the complicated environment which they're going to operate must be reduced to a scalar quantity, a pure number. You can tell me it can't be done. I agree with you, but it must be. Somehow you must choose the best or the best three or the best seven or something. You can't do anything else. Now, they won't be the same. They're obviously difficult. Well, I can use machine methods, or I can use intuition. And I tend to like intuition, although I just told you a story why machine methods, which are systematic, are sometimes better. Most of the time, human judgments are very good, all things considered, provided the people are mature. They have gotten to the point where they can recognize their prejudices and not overcompensate. 
overcompensating, I can tell you a good example. In my earliest days of teaching, when a student is flunking a course, and you say calculus again, and you really don't like the bastard, what you do is you invite him into your office and say, look, uh, Joe, you really ought to flunk, because you haven't done so well, but if you want, I'll pass you. You can bet every time he will take the pass. And as he walks out of the office, says, like I said, I really screwed that guy. He'll never really know mathematics now because he didn't learn the calculus class. He's dead. So I got my revenge. Well, that, you see, is not something I should allow myself to do. I did it when I was just a young instructor. After a little while, I realized the evil of that. That is not the proper way to behave. You have to know yourself. You have to be very careful. But when you get people who are sophisticated enough to know their prejudices, know other things, then judgments monitored by watching themselves are generally better than measuring instruments of so many questionnaires and so on. But sometimes you have to. In the AT&T running all the Bell companies faced a problem. Since it was a monopoly, how do we run it inefficiently? Answer, we broke it up into a bunch of operating companies and we rate one against the other. And so they put out questionnaires covering a large number of things and everybody in the company filled them out and we processed those things and we got the means and variances and we found the morale was low in such and such, say Southern Bell was high in Illinois Bell or something else. Then at t looked into the matter. Why was one high and one low? And they got after the guy with a low one and said, hey, you're way down there, get better. They did an enormous amount of internal rating to produce internal comp competition. This is a thing frequently done, but uh, not done as often perhaps as we ought to. It's not too well. Now, I'll give you some other things which are wrong. In the U.S. Navy, as I understand it, Inspection for this or that is scheduled well, well in advance. And you're inspected for cleanliness or readiness or this or that feature. Everybody knows it's coming. And so the skipper gets prepared for this test. And he passes. Then he probably gets ready for the next one. The next one. Well, when we come to war games, we must use this data. But that data you see does not represent the true readiness of the fleet. By no means. It represents this one at that moment, this one at that moment, this one at that moment, but not the total. And I've objected to that ever since I first got in and said, hey, yeah, where does data come from? Oh, that's how you measure it. Well, that data doesn't measure readiness of the fleet. The Air Force had a different method, which a captive friend of mine explained to me one time. Their inspections are at random, apparently. But as he said, any guy at air base who's got a radar going knows what's in the air, and if a inspection flight comes in that he doesn't know is coming in, he deserves what he gets. But it's true, he hasn't got as long a time to repair. So random inspection does some good, but you really, the moment that random inspection is sent, the grapevine gets going, and faster than the velocity of light, the knowledge is out to who is going to be inspected. It's remarkable how leakage occurs of that type from secretaries and other things. That what is supposed to be kept dead secret is out almost immediately. So it's not too easy to do random inspections. But it's more likely to measure what you want rather than what you do when you get a nice formal. The other ones, however, are much more polite. Oh my God, they're much more polite. Now, I want to talk about something else. Earthquakes, as you know, are rated on a Richter scale, which is some multiple of the log of the energy released. I think it's something like a three log, which means uh, if they differ by one in the Richter scale, it's something like a factor of a thousand more energy release. Well, the Richter scale shows you that 6.6s and 6.5s and 6.7s are rare. There are lots of twos and threes and fours. Richter scale was convenient for one purpose, but I don't think nature uses Richter scale to decide which distribution of earthquakes it's going to have. It's got some other distribution entirely. It doesn't use that kind of units. Scaling from meters to feet has no difference, but when you scale logarithmically or you do something else like that, you vastly affect what 
you're going to see. Now, in the human being, experience has taught us for fine discriminations of the senses, the logarithmic scale is probably the best. You can detect very, very faint sounds, but at a high, pit, high intensities, you can't detect those small differences. It's roughly a logarithmic scale. Your sound, sight, and brightness, touch, and so on, basically are that way for many purposes. It's logarithmic scale, but you have to find these out. How to find the natural scale is not an obvious question, and the statisticians won't do you a lot of good. Furthermore, I've got a terrible observation. What may be the right scale for making some types of decisions may not be for another. For example, you have a herd of cows. You have three, and you get three more. Well, we use additive ones, and we say, oh, yeah, we got three more cows. You have a 1,000 cows. We add three more. Well, additive scale, three more cows, three more cows. But I think you'll agree that if you have three and add three, or you have a 1,000 and add three, the arithmetic scale is really not the way to look at the problem. It's more the percentage change in the size of the herd. We often use an arithmetic scale because it'll enable us to combine two herds together. But then we use it for judging other things when we shouldn't. And I suggest to you that different scales are needed for different things. And frequently in physics, you inspect it closely. You will see that, in fact, the equations which you use to substitute in are, in some sense, doing some scaling for you. Very frequently, your scaling is done for you by that method but frequently not. Now, I mentioned you earlier the fact that people try to optimize things. As top management, you will find that lower management is always trying to make themselves look good. They're bending things slightly. They're not lying. They're just bending. The only thing that saves top management is that, by and large, lower management are bending it this way, this way, and this way. So something due to law, weak law of large numbers, something near the truth emerges at the top. So you have a basis for making decisions. If the whole organization is bent one way, you will have trouble finding out. Now, you can do what I did, which is not popular. I read about the legal situation on boards of directors before I started serving. I spent a week, two weeks at Illinois, uh, Chicago and talked to the legal department and the business schools and got quite a few uh, copies of court decisions. I started going there one day early at the board meeting or staying one day late. For example, when we had high inventory and the inventory is a big problem, I say one day late. I'm walking down the hall deliberately and I turn suddenly and go into the crib where supplies are held for inventory. Well, I'm dressed properly. The guy in charge of the crib can't really do anything. He knows very well he better not to try to throw me out, although he doesn't, he's not sure who I am. And I look. And having prepared my mind for a long while, I look around this way. Yeah, that's about $12 million worth of goods, I guess. OK, the inventory figure is right, probably. Another thing I did is I looked at the loading platform. Were the machines being shipped actually being shipped? Well, yes, in our case. But I found out something bad. In order to meet the shipping date, other machines coming down the line were sometimes cannibalized for spare parts so they have enough parts to get this one done and get it shipped because the salesman got paid by the quarter. As a result, the next week or two, there were practically no shipments. We were busy trying to undo the cannibalizing we'd done of the machines. When I brought this to the top management's attention, there was nothing you could do about it. It was a custom in the organization highly counterproductive to meet the three months shipping dates. Now, when uh, the beginning of next quarter, something might be shipped and three days later a piece of paper comes down. But at the end of the quarter, the moment that thing leaves the loading dock, the shipping paper goes down and it's shipped, bing, like that, with all the cannibalization and other things they've done. You will find the organization does not do what you think it's doing. It's got some idiotic habits some of which you cannot prevent. Some of you can. The way I measure is what I think is the only method. You go out and look for yourself. I may be a theoretician and so on. I went out and looked to see what was going on. I looked at the, where the machines were actually. F I didn't. Now, on a board of directors, you're required to show due prudence. And I would say any ranking officer is required to do 
show due prudence in any organization. Due prudence doesn't mean you can keep an independent accounting system, but it does mean that you are not a sucker for anything anybody ever tells you. If the treasurer hands you all these figures, and this is what's going on in the books, you make some independent choices. Look around here, there, and yon. So if you find your witness stand, you can say to the judge, I show due prudence, this and this and this is what I did to try and verify those numbers were approximately right. It's one of the things you need to do, you can't believe the underlings. Rating systems are not always accurate. You get what you measure, and what you measure is a strange business. Now there's another thing that happens. The popularity of a form of measurement has nothing to do with its reliability or its accuracy. Not at all. I need to get another one. Oh, another thing. What you want to know is something a lower level cannot deliver. For example, they may give you the, what they think is a capability, but the next level will interpret that as a probability. They will change the meaning willfully because what you want cannot be obtained and various people along the way will bend what is meant until it fits what top management is asking for. But of course, the bending didn't improve the numbers at all. It left the same thing. I discussed you life testing, which is almost impossible. Now, the summary, I want to say this. I've told you enough horror stories. Before you find yourself putting in a rating system, ask yourself, what will be the long-term global effects? You all know that when a rating system is changed, you change your behavior pattern, so you'd rate well. You put a new rating system, what will happen? What kind of people will you attract? Ten years later, who will you have in these positions? What will happen? The rating system determines what the organization is going to be to a great extent. And it is so much neglected that I'm appalled at how little attention the average person pays to oh, well, we can count so on. The supreme example you would know is software. We started rating software programmers by the number of lines written. Is there any incentive for them to clean up a program? No. Is there an incentive for putting bells and whistles? Yes. As a result, we now have tremendously bloated software. Over generations, we have not disciplined the people to be automatically clean it up and get it down and get the minimal instruction. Therefore, you have these programs which fill megabytes of memory when probably more than half of it is sheer wasted. We adopted a system of measuring, namely by lines of code, and we encouraged a style behavior pattern, and now we're stuck with it. And you can see it clearly what it is. And so I'll leave that with you as an example of the dangers of this business. Okay, see you tomorrow.